AWS Loft Talks. So real quick, how many people in the crowd do performance testing of any sort? Performance testing, load testing. Okay, a couple. How many do testing at all? Any kind of testing. Okay, good, good, good enough. All right, nobody likes to get mad at their gadgets when an app is slow or when a site is slow. Uh, in fact, we tend to go to Facebook or find out, you know, someone's cousin's best friend got married and had a really interesting lunch or take a quiz to, you know, find out what breed of dog you are or whatever. The expectations are growing and growing for performance for our sites. 49% of people surveyed by Akamai expect pages to load in under two seconds. I remember when this was like eight, which I think was like two years ago. It was like eight was frustrating. Uh, so now about half, half the people surveyed expect two seconds, and 30% expect a one-second response, and 18% expect instantaneous response time. So we might as well shoot for instantaneous, right? Um, one of the problems that, that we've had is uh, load testing has been difficult to do, especially as we've gotten faster with iterative development and with CI and CD and we're moving really quickly. Um, we found ways to make functional testing work with Selenium and other tools. We found ways to get better at the practice of testing. Uh, but load testing has kind of remained behind. And probably when I say load testing, you think of something like this. And this is sort of the classic war room, uh, in this case, actually a war room. But uh, we, tend to, we tend to think this, right? We think we get everybody together, we get all the stakeholders. We have complicated scripts that took two months to develop, and we had to you know, submit a ticket to get the right people involved. Then everybody's got to get scheduled. We get the monitoring guys, we get the database team, the application owners, and everybody gets together, and they conduct this really elaborate test. They find out where things fall down, and then they go back, they re-engineer, they try to fix, and they do it again. And when we had 18-month release cycles, we could do this. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, yesterday's tools were designed for this kind of operation, and we can't really do this anymore. We still, it's still a really good idea for event prep or s seasonal readiness. Got a lot of Black Friday testing happening now. Uh, or a really, you know, big release with a lot of sprints kind of rolled up into it. But we need something a little more modern, and we need we need we have a, f a few I think a few um, key uh, attributes that we need for a, a performance testing solution that's going to work in DevOps and continuous delivery. We need a couple of things. We need to be able to incrementally build tests from commit to commit. Basically what we want to do is start to be able to define our performance tests alongside feature code and keep them in the same place, right? So when we're updating features or we're doing fixes, we're also able to up update the test. And so we want atomic tests that kind of map to specific classes or whatever we're doing. Uh, so that we can kind of keep the updated, uh, the automation updated, which has always been a really big challenge with automation, is, is keeping the automation itself current with the application. So we want to be able to do that. We also want to be able to build tests in code, keep them in the repo, and run them in parallel. Right? We want the, the test to conform to the practices that we're doing with other tools and other processes in our delivery pipelines. We want them to work with existing tools. Uh, we don't want to have to give anything up. We all love our tools. We have things fairly stable. You know, we're using our development environment that's very peculiar or specific to us, and we're using Jenkins, and we're using Chef. We want to make sure that we can keep those processes in place as we adopt a new thing in that workflow. So what do we have available in open source? We can start with Selenium. I think Selenium, um, it can kind of sort of do some performance testing if, you're, if your demands are very low. It really wasn't designed to scale. It's designed for functional testing, and it doesn't have much in the way of things like timers or uh, what we call think time or you know, artificial delays. And you can probably only realistically get you know, 20 to 50 browsers open on a single box. Uh, and 50 would probably be a pretty big one. So it it's not really designed for load testing. But a lot of people ask me if they can use Selenium scripts for load testing. And I think ultimately we'll try to get there. But anyway, it doesn't really work now. And Gatling uh, on the bottom left there is very cool. It's a Scala app. Um, you write your code in Scala. And it's, it's what it says. It's like a machine gun that just really hammers your app with requests. 
but it doesn't do a lot in the way of complication, complicated or complex tests, sophisticated tests, that you want to do things like model different kind of load profiles throughout the course of the test uh, or the atomic kind of thing that we're talking about. Uh, on, the upper, on the upper left uh, is Locust, which is new, and it's Python, and it's actually very cool, but it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit new, so it doesn't quite have the feature set that we want yet. But it does have this concept of swarms, which is cool, so your load test can kind of be a, a biblical plague. And then, of course, uh, there's JMeter. JMeter in the middle. I'll talk about JMeter in, 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 a, in a minute. And when I say open source load testing, probably most people think JMeter. Uh, it's sort of the 800-pound gorilla. And then finally, there's a new tool called Taurus. That's going to be my focus tonight. This is a really cool tool, and this is you can think of it as performance testing as code. Uh, and we'll take a look at the details. First, let's talk about JMeter and why it won't work. Um, the reigning champion, as it were. Uh, this is a JMeter test in XML. It looks OK in just the screenshot, but if you look to the left in the Sublime window that I captured, it's a 400-line XML file. That's four URL requests. That's all that test does, is it hits four endpoints. And there's a little bit of you know instrumentation in there, but it's really not that complicated. But that's the test. That's not going to work. That's not going to do the things that we need to kind of fit into those uh, practices that we have. And then also JMeter is a GUI-driven application. So everything that you do, if you really want to get the rich functionality of JMeter, which is very, very rich, by the way, it's a very well thought through tool, you have to do it all in a thick Java client, which this might be the last thick Java client in the world. Um, and you do everything through right-clicking, which is just odd. So JMeter is not really a solution. Taurus was introduced about a year ago. It's very lightweight. You do everything in YAML or JSON. It is meant to fit into modern de DevOps kind of practices. Uh, and the, uh, it comes from an acronym which actually stands for Test Automation Running Smoothly. But it's actually Test Automation Russian style, the uh, developers in Moscow. Uh, I'm not sure which came first. We might have made a joke about that secondarily to running smoothly. In any case, it gives us an opportunity for uh, some nice horns in there. So let's talk a little bit about a Taurus test. Um, Taurus works in YAML or JSON, as I said, and it gives it, it's really great because you have the opportunity to define the test very clearly using very common syntax. So there are a couple of different key areas of a Taurus test. I'm just going to cover three of them here, uh, but it can do pretty much everything we need. So first, uh, we define the execution conditions. In this case, we're thinking about how many concurrent users we want to send to the to the application. Concurrency means sessions, right? It's not necessarily hits per second. Uh, it's the number of um, threads, essentially, that we're talking about. And then we want to think about how long it should take to get to that concurrency uh, level that we specified. In this case, one minute. So that's one user starting a session less than one minute up to, uh, up to that 100 concurrent. And then we think about the duration, in this case, five minutes. We can run really short tests, which fit really nicely with builds and, and other kind of automated processes that we don't want to delay things. Then we define the actual request themselves. And if it's just a GET request, all we have to do is put in the URL. Uh, I trimmed this one down for the sake of the slide, but uh, you just put in your, your URL, and, and it knows it, it's going to just run a GET with it. If there's parameter data, you can describe that um, a little bit more elaborately. The second request there, uh, in, just so you know, what this is, is this app is a dummy app that we have, a demo app that's a reservation system. So people go and choose some cities uh, to fly to and from, and then they go and choose their flight and check out and whatever. So here, what we're doing, that reserve PHP file, uh, we're posting the cities that this, uh, this you know, theoretical user wants to fly to and from, in this case, Boston and, and London. As you can see, all we're doing is defining the method, the post, adding a custom header to accept the data, and then defining the actual uh, values for those two variables. And those can be parameterized. You can actually put a CSV file. Just to, you just define where the, uh, where the file lives and then turn those arguments into uh, typical dollar curly brace syntax. In terms of failing builds or raising flags or making this work for us, we want to add criteria. So you can see here I have a fail criteria for the test, average response time greater than 150 milliseconds, in this case for 10 seconds, and then I want to stop the test as failed. But there are lots of different things that we can do. We can continue the test as failed. We can continue the test as warning. We can use different values like hits per second or error rate, and we can even label the transaction. So we can say if the home page is slower than five seconds for 10 seconds, then 
continue the test but raise a warning flag. So let's talk about where Taurus can fit in a CD workflow. First, we can just run them from the command line. So you can imagine you're in a development environment or you're in your own kind of local workstation and you want to basically run a performance test. You can do that. You can do it right from the command line. You just type bzt and your test name uh, .yaml. You can do multiple tests, right? So you can run two tests, three tests, four tests, all at the same time, which presents a really good opportunity to do things like separate logic out. You could have a test that just defined your failure criteria. You could have, I'm sorry, a YAML file that just defined your failure criteria or a YAML that defined your execution conditions and you could keep your test logic separate. When you run them all on the same, as part of the same BZT command, Taurus merges them together intelligently. And if you do happen to try this, keep in mind that the last YAML in the list will override any common settings that the previous YAMLs had. But it's a great way to combine all that logic together. So you can start with a couple of tests, you know, just locally or maybe a few tests in your build. And then as you go further down the, the pipeline, you can start to run more and more complex tests just by bringing these YAMLs all together. Um, and this is what Taurus looks like when you kick it off. There are a couple of different reporting options, but if you're just running straight from your local workstation, then the, this console will pop up and it will give you everything you need to see. It gives you nice kind of uh, ASCII art graphs. Uh, you can see uh, all the important stats. You can see things like the response time for each individual page, the number of hits it's, uh, it's taking per second, and uh, any kind of failures that might be happening. It even shows you the, uh, the actual error messages. The next step, of course, is to commit and run uh, tests in the build. And so here, uh, another example, you can see BZT3 uh, YAML files there. And notice the uh, minus O flag that I have. That's telling it not to run that console, which looks really weird in uh, Jenkins' uh, uh, console output um, when it tries to paint that ASCII art. But here's where we get into the thresholds, and this is where we can say, you know, if the test, if a particular transaction takes longer than some amount of seconds, then fail the build or raise some kind of flag um, or continue but just mark it. So it gives us some options there in performance testing, which we haven't had before, which we can do with things like Selenium or Cucumber or whatever. So because we were coming to AWS, I spent a little time last night with Code Deploy, which was cool. Um, I hadn't actually used it before. With uh, Code Deploy, how many people have used it? Okay, a few. Um, you define an app spec file, which is the instructions for what Code Deploy should do with your software. Right? It's going to download it. It's going to copy it somewhere. It's going to run some scripts. It's going to do whatever you need it to do to make sure that it's installed correctly, dependencies, and so forth. So I worked with that a little bit. I put my TARS file right in the, the top level of my repo there. And then that's what, that's what the app spec looks like. And... Um, you just define, uh, it's another YAML file, and you just define those, those different actions that happen uh, at different stages of the code deploy workflow. Uh, so I put my, my Taurus test in there after the install, and then there's my test in the repo, and then I deploy it. It's actually really cool. It's very simple. But check it out for my repo, and then this is what it looks like running. And so this is a blaze meter report. If you use Taurus, we make reporting available freely. You don't even need an account. It can be totally anonymous. Uh, because obviously a command line tool doesn't, you know, that console is cool, but, you know, you want something a little bit more rich and elaborate. You want something your team can rally around when you're reviewing the results. And these are those same critical KPIs that we saw in that, in that ASCII report. Uh, uh, hits per second, maximum uh, virtual users, the concurrency, and then the response time. But we could keep track of a lot of different... Uh, a lot of different values, and these are really useful reports for doing postmortems and sort of understanding what went wrong. From here, you would probably go into New Relic or AppD or something that you're using to get a little bit deeper into the stack and see what's happening, which you can do the same thing. So you can run your test. You can see there in, in, uh, in my middle stage there, I'm doing a code deploy. And then at the bottom, actually, Blaze Meter is integrated, so I did a CDN test, which was running at the end there. But basically, we feel like, like I said, um, um, I think it was Brian actually who said this uh, the other day, but, but performance testing as code is basically what we're talking about. You know, being able to manage your performance tests granularly in a YAML file or JSON or programmatically and really being able to start to do performance testing in a way we couldn't do before um, because it, it really is critical. And, you know, you don't want people surfing away from your app or, or giving your app one star or whatever else it might be. So thanks for your time. AWS Loft Talks.